So what do you see when you look at a fruit fly? Probably a nuisance, right? Well, I'd agree with you, but I'd also say that fruit flies are some of the smartest creatures on the planet. And what I found is that fruit flies, along with some other organisms in nature, are really good models for creating low-cost autonomous robots. And so today I'm going to tell you about some behaviors in nature that I find really fascinating, and then talk about how I'm applying those behaviors to create tiny flying robots like this one for search and rescue and emergency response. So all of this started two summers ago when my family went to India on vacation. We were there for about three weeks, and we had a good time. But when we got back, we realized that we had left some bananas on the kitchen counter. And so there's this bunch of rotten bananas sitting on our kitchen counter. And as a result, our house was filled with these fruit flies. And so I kept trying to swat them, and they kept escaping, and I got really mad. But then I started to think. Fruit flies are really tiny. They probably have a really small brain. They must have awful vision. They really don't have very much of anything. So what could they possibly be doing to escape so effectively? <laughs> and as it turns out, the answer is a lot. First, fruit flies take the time to plan out their escape, even when they ultimately decide to stay where they are. And then to carry out this escape, they first jump to the side, and then they use their wings to move vertically. And all of this happens within about a third of a second, so literally in the blink of an eye. So that's cool, but there's something more going on here. So remember how I said that fruit flies have awful vision? Well, that's true in the conventional sense. So for example, this is how fruit fly vision compares to ours. But here's the thing. Because their eyes produce such little information, they can process that information really quickly. So they can actually see 10 times faster than we can. And so that may be a little hard to visualize. So to put it in perspective, I slowed down both how fruit flies would see and how we would see. And so you can see that although we'd see in much more detail, fruit flies can see much faster, 10 times faster. And that means that they can process all of that information and all that motion and react to that really quickly. And so that's really advantageous when they're trying to escape from something. And so in some sense, fruit flies are so good at escaping because they have really bad eyesight. So they can't see a lot, but that means that they can process what they can see and react to that really quickly. Around the same time as, as this fruit fly incident, flying robots or drones had been in the news a lot. And while most of the stories I read, like these, talked about how these robots were crashing into things or taking selfies or doing generally useless things, uh, I also started to read about how they might be able to help after natural disasters. And it turns out that flying robots are really good. They're perfect for these types of applications because they're really small and they're really agile. So they can go into tight spaces or they can fly around obstacles. But the problem here is that they can't really react to their environment. So for example, if, if we have a flying robot like this and it's going into a building after an earthquake and the ceiling collapses, uh, then the flying robot is done. It can't react to that. It can't respond to that. And so I wanted to see whether we could make flying robots respond to threats, respond to moving threats like fruit flies do. And so I wanted to see whether I could draw from what I learned about fruit fly escape to make flying robots better. And so I spent the next few months building prototypes and soldering and coding. And this is what I came up with. It's a really tiny flying robot. It's about 10 centimeters across. And I call it Flybot. And it uh, has these two infrared distance sensors. So those are the eye-looking things on either side. And basically, they bounce periodically. They bounce this small amount of infrared light up. And they measure how much returns. And then based on that, they're able to see how far something is away from them. Each of them returns a single number. And I created some algorithms that use this, these numbers, these two numbers, to construct a model of how the threat moves over time. And then based on that, it actually makes predictions about when the threat will hit the robot. And then from that, it can decide when and how to escape. And I'd love to give you guys a demo of this. This is a sheet of wood, so this is what I'm, what I'm using to simulate a threat. Um, but this could be a collapsing ceiling or an object that could fall and damage the drone. So right now, I'm connecting to it. And then once it connects, I'll be able to show you how it's able to escape. OK, so as something approaches, it's able to detect that and respond to that really quickly. It mimics these fruit fly motions. So it first flies to the side, and then it flies vertically. Let's see that a couple more times. Maybe I'll catch it. And then it can respond to different things as well. So if I try to hit it, for example, it's able to respond to that really quickly. And so again, this could be used in search and rescue, right? So if, if we have one of these robots, and it's going into a, an earthquake damage building after an earthquake, and then it sees something, and it needs to react to that. So if the ceiling collapses or, or something falls, then it's able to respond to that and continue on what it's doing. So I'm trying to make flying robots more autonomous. So this worked really well. Uh, and so I wanted to see whether we could draw from other aspects of biology to make flying robots better. Um, and one of the biggest problems with flying robots is this thing called mapping. So basically making a map of your environment so you can see what's around you and, and avoid hitting it, avoid colliding, with, uh, colliding into it. It turns out that fruit flies are really good models for this. Uh, so what fruit flies do, actually, is they see in terms of edges. So they have these four neurons in their brain that track light and dark edges. And they use this, these edges for a variety of things. So if I was a fruit fly uh, and I wanted to hover here, I would actually look for this horizontal edge, and I would track that, and I would fly in line with that. 
And then fruit flies also use edges uh, for avoiding collisions. So edges are a really good way to simplify your environment because you can discard a lot of things you don't really care about, like color and texture, while keeping things you do care about, which are obstacles. And birds are really good models for, for mapping or for perception as well. Uh, so what birds have, as you can see, they have their eyes on opposite sides of their head. And so rather than doing what we do, which is using both of our eyes to see depth, birds have to use each eye independently. They can't combine their eyes at all because their eyes see completely different things. Um, and so what birds do is they actually look at how objects become bigger over time. So, so if I was a bird, I guess, uh, as I get closer to something, I'd see how it becomes bigger, and I would actually use that to see where it is in my environment. And so to mimic this, I created an algorithm uh, for flying robots. It's really fast. It, ac it actually can process 81 camera images per second. And what this does is it uses a single camera, a single two-dimensional camera, to make a map of a three-dimensional environment. This is an example of a cluttered environment. It's a cluttered lab at Carnegie Mellon. First, I find edges in that environment, and then I actually detect and associate those edges. So I say that's the left, left edge of an obstacle, and that's the right edge. And then I look at how they expand over time, or how they move apart over time, just like birds do, uh, to find where those obstacles are. And this works really well. So it's really fast. First, 81, it can process 81 images per second. It also works really effectively. So here's a video of, of how that works. And so you can see that it's able to, to use the expansion of edges. And edges are everywhere. Edges, every object has edges. It's able to use the expansion of those edges uh, to, to detect and respond to a variety of obstacles in this really cluttered lab. That worked really well. So, so I was able to look at fruit flies initially and then also, also birds later on. And both of those were, worked really well. And so I wanted to see whether we could solve other problems with flying robots uh, based on biology. And so, so one of the things I was thinking about was that right now I had done these things with escaping and, and with avoiding obstacles. But that actually doesn't do very much for people. So if I give a, f a firefighter, for example, one of these drones, uh, then they really can't do anything with it. So it really doesn't find anything. And so one of the questions I asked was, what if we had a robot, what if we had a flying robot that could actually find things? So for example, we could send this robot into a burning building, and it could find where the fire is. It could find someone who's trapped. And again, it turns out that fruit flies are really good models for this. And I don't even like fruit flies. I, I find them really annoying. <laughs> but they're good at almost everything they do. And so one of the things that, one of the really cool things about fruit flies is they're able to zero in on bananas really well. And it turns out, uh, it turns out oftentimes, they, don't, they can't even smell that when they start out. And so what they do is they look for these bright yellow objects that could be bananas. And then they go closer to them and start smelling them to determine what they actually are. Uh, and so, so this behavior is something called sensor fusion in, in computer science and robotics. And what that means is taking multiple senses, so vision and, and smell, and combining them to get a more accurate picture of what's around you. Uh, and, and to actually fly to these bananas, to fly to these potential bananas, what fruit flies do, rather than swerving or doing this really complicated thing, at any given time they're either moving forward or they're turning. So they alternate between moving forward and turning. And so they're able to combine these really simple behaviors uh, to really effectively and really efficiently find food. And bacteria actually do something similar, which is really cool because bacteria are a single cell. They don't have a brain or nerves or anything like that. And so what bacteria do is, is they do something called the biased random walk. Uh, and so, for example, if they're trying to find the source of food, they play this game of warmer, colder. So as they're getting warmer, as they're moving closer to the food, they keep moving in, in this random direction. And then whenever they get colder, so whenever they start to, get, start to move away from the food, they turn in a random direction and try again. And so basically what they're doing is using the same behaviors of moving forward and turning, and they're able to really effectively locate food. And so to mimic these behaviors, I created this flying sensor platform. So it has a bunch of sensors. It has two gas sensors, and they can sense carbon dioxide and smoke, which are really good markers of fire. And then it also has two temperature sensors and a camera. And what I'm doing here is combining the information from all of these sensors to be able to locate fires. Uh, and so this is, again, this is the sensory fusion behavior that we find in fruit flies. And then to actually fly, this robot mimics those two behaviors. So it first flies forward, and then at, at certain points within its flight, it turns to change direction. Uh, all of this hardware costs around $90 compared to tens of thousands of dollars for previous work. Uh, and so this is a really cheap platform, and it's really effective for first responders. And so I actually conducted some experiments uh, with some local firefighters. And so we set these small controlled fires, and you can see one there. Um, and we had my robot find them. And so uh, I'll let this video play, and you'll see that it starts really far from the fire. It can actually see it. And so it uses all of these senses. It uses gas and heat and vision to be able to locate it.
and you'll see that it, ran, it lands right next to the fire. And so one of the ways, one of the places this can be applied is in schools. And so, so I was talking with these firefighters, and one of the things they mentioned is that if a fire is in a school, what they actually have to do is go room by room trying to find where the fire is, because they have no information that could help them. Uh, and so this is really inefficient. It takes a long time. And kids could be trapped in, in, in the school, and, and they really have no way to get out. And so one of the ways this could be applied is going into that school and really efficiently, within about a minute or two, finding where the fire is using all of these senses and, and looking at biology. And so what I'm working on now is combining all of my work, so combining escaping and avoiding obstacles and navigation and finding things uh, to create this one low-cost platform that firefighters and first responders can use all across the world to save lives with drones. But none of this would have been possible without the really effective and really simple ways in which nature has solved all of these problems. So let me leave you with this. Look around, think about how things work, and you'll find inspiration in the most overlooked of places. Thank you. <laughs>